Welcome to Embedded. I am Elicia White alongside Christopher White. We are excited to welcome Helen Lee back to the show. This time we're going to talk about crowd supply and tear down their conference and, well, whatever else we feel like talking about. Hi, Helen. Hi. Lovely to be back. Thank you so much for having me. Could you tell us about yourself as if we just met at a hardware happy hour? Sure, of course. <laughs> so um, I am a self-taught hardware hacker and open source enthusiast, I'm currently living in Portland, Oregon. Um, the stuff I make is primarily musical instruments. Um, um, before moving to Portland, I was active in both the Berlin and London hacker communities, did lots of stuff in both of those. Um, and I used to make my living doing um, writing writing things about making, right? So I would make projects, write about them. I'd make products from time to time. Um, and that's what I did for about 10 years. But now I live in the US on the West Coast. Um, I've taken a job at Crowd Supply where I am head of community. So I'm sure we'll be talking about that. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> and are you ready for lightning round? I'm ready. I'm so ready for lightning round. What is your dog's name? Flux. <laughs> a good name. Oh yeah, she's a she's got a personality, that's for sure. <laughs> what kind of dog is it? Um, she's a street dog, um, a mutt, um, very badly behaved, but also very adorable. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. The next question is: Is it a good dog? So, such a good dog, such a good <laughs> dog. But sometimes, uh, sometimes she's not fond of strange men. Let's be. <laughs> So she barks a lot at people she doesn't know, but um, in the house, she's very well behaved. Is she a fetch dog or a sniffy dog or a lap dog? Oh, all three. All mm. three. <laughs> uh, when you go for a walk, does, is, is it she? She? Does she yeah, walk yeah, yeah. well on a leash or does she turn yes. around and look at you and walk backwards the entire length of the walk? <laughs> the, she's a good walker. She's a good walker. Jojo's a good She'll... walker. She just walks backwards. <laughs> it's adorable. <laughs> That's really funny and cute. <laughs> does she have any clothes? Does she have any clothes? Yeah, yeah, she does. So um, she has actually uh, only has one coat and has a bald belly as well sometimes. So we have to put a coat on her when we go outside um, or she gets very cold. In the winter, I should say, not in the summer. Uh, does she have any lights or light fixture, not fixtures? Light, light things, lights, blinking things on her. You know... No, <laughs> no, she does not. Um, but maybe we should get um, an LED collar for her, light it up. <laughs> Shocking, but I haven't put any LEDs on her yet. <laughs> and do you have a tip everyone should know? Oh, yeah. So um, before we started recording this, <laughs> my tip was going to be um, that, you know, like when you go through self-checkouts, um, you can mute them most of the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, or turn them down at least. So that's my number one, just normal life uh, thing. But so today it was difficult for us to get the microphone working. And I just broke out Alva Alvaro's amazing um, USB cable tester called Is It USB or Is It Me? Um, which is has saved my life on so many occasions. Um, so that is my tip today. I've, I've switched my tip from the supermarket um, checkout to the you got to get this USB cable tester. You know, it's great. It lets you know if it's got data, if it's actually passing data through or for it's just just power. So I use it a lot. Thanks, Alvaro. <laughs> and that's Alvaro Prieto from the Unnamed Reverse Engineering Podcast. So we'll put a link to the USB or me. Yeah, we love it. We are happy to be sponsored this week by Memfault. Memfault provides a device reliability platform for IoT monitoring, debugging, and updates. Device operation no longer needs to be a scramble as issues with fielded units pile up. Instead, Memfault gives developers a more scalable and sustainable process to accelerate time to market, de-risk product launches, cut development costs, and deliver higher quality products. So if you're wondering how you're going to monitor your units once they're shipped, or whether your firmware update plan is secure enough, it's time to take a look at Memfault, or you can read their Interrupt blog. 
for all of its fantastic goodies on how to debug hard faults, monitor units, or generally write good embedded code. Embedded FM listeners will get 25% off their first year with Memfault if you request a demo through go.memfault.com slash demo dash request dash embedded FM. It's a link you can find in our show notes. Thank you to Memfault for sponsoring this week's show. Okay, so you are planning a conference. I am, yes. Why would you do that? You know, it's been a question I've been asking myself. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I've done a lot of community events. Um, this has been my first conference conference, um, but I've been working in um, kind of grassroots community events for a really long time. When I say working, I'm, I don't mean professionally. I've been just going to a lot of them and like putting on workshops and putting on um, small events like uh, I've run Hardware Happy Hour in probably like 10 different cities at this point. Um, I've set up a bunch of different events, including Sound Hackers, which is my local event, which actually is going on the road to po- uh, to Oakland in a couple of weeks, um, which is all about sharing ha- people people's methodologies for making instruments, right, from some guys talking about how they're using FPGAs for prototyping to people talking about like different materials they're using. Just, um, yeah. So I've got, I've got a history. I've put on a lot of events before. Um, and I've been very involved, um, in, uh, like a lot of the Euro hacker events. I've been part of hardware hacking village for a bunch of years now. So I feel like I kind of know what makes a good event. Um, at least in my eyes. Uh, and I just really feel like, yeah, I just really feel like doing it. I'm, I'm excited actually. Um, e- even though I probably will regret it. <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, I, I'm pretty excited. It's a big challenge for me to actually run a conference, but, um, one that I'm doing with a lot of enjoyment actually. Does it seem like it's stacking a bunch of those smaller events together or is it a totally different animal? Um, in some ways it's different. Um, in that you've got lot, you have to balance the needs of a lot of different areas, you know, and you've got to, uh, it's not just, there's not just one focus, right? So you've got to make sure that there's a good flow, a good balance, and that everybody's got something that's going to keep them interested and happy, you know? So it's, um, it's, it's an exciting, it's an exciting challenge, that's for sure. And so there's the programming, the keeping everybody interested, mm-hmm. interested. Of course. Um, and that there are a lot of facets of that with, um, getting the right people and mm. getting the right audience and making sure that everybody understands. But then there's all this, what goes on with the wedding planning part of logistics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a huge part of it. Um, we don't start really looking at the content until, you know, a good three months into planning. Um, we The content's really important, but there's also a bunch of stuff that you need to think about in order to, ha- you know, put on a minimum viable conference, you know, from food and drink to, like, venue, insurance, contracts, AV stuff, internet. I'm having to put my own internet in, in the venue I've chosen, which is wow. an interesting proposition, I know. <laughs> Making a bit of a rod for my own back with the interesting venue that I've chosen, but uh, but I think it's all going to be worth it. Um, yeah, so as long as you've got minimum viable conference, right? You've got you've got people fed, you've got people watered, you've got the internet, you've got some AV going on. You know, everything else is a bonus. So just making sure that that core structure is done, and then you can slot interesting people or and interesting things around that, right? Okay, so the conference is tear down. Um, I don't know that we've said that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we haven't actually. We haven't, we haven't talked about the conference. So let me just describe Teardown. Let's rewind a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) So, so Teardown is a conference that has been run by the company I work for, Crowd Supply, for a number of years, um, since 2018, actually. Um, and it's all about the practice of hardware, right? So it is very practical focused talks, um, Really, people who are making stuff, talking to other people who are making stuff is the primary, like, if that's the most, um, the most prevalent part of, of the conference. There's lots of workshops. We have a hacker art exhibit. We're having a retro computing area. We're doing loads of projects. People come from all over um, to talk about really interesting things. Um, last year, we had uh, Benny Huang came along to talk about advanced PCB manufacturing services, which was super interesting. 
Um, and just we get a really nice range of people talking from very practical, um, advanced engineering topics to people talking about how to make good documentation, how to build community, and then people talking about their projects that they do for fun. It's very hackery. It's very, um, it's, it's more, um, grassroots than like a big conference. You know, it's, it's not like, um, people in polo shirts with roller banners. That's for sure. It's mostly people who are bringing their, pro- it's, it's like a hack and tell vibe. If you remember that, right. After maker for a Bay area, they would always do a hack and tell. Um, and that was super cool. So it's like very much like a hack and tell vibe. Lots of people bring their projects. Lots of people bring their stuff they're working on. And then, yeah, it's, it's not really, you're not going to see any uh, pitch decks. It's hardware, but it's very much about the actual practicality of it, um, as well as a lot of the ethics. We talk a lot about open source as well, you know, because that's our focus. Um, yeah. And that's that's uh, that's Teardown. It is it is pretty fun, and that it's got a bit of a Portland twist to it. I actually heard of Teardown before I heard of Crowd Supply, um, which is an interesting twist. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really cool conference, and I'm pretty excited to be given the reins of it. And it's going to be in Portland. It will be in Portland. Yes, the 21st through 23rd of June is when it's going to be. Um, there will be pre-game and post-game. So um, OMSI, which is the science museum here, they're going to do a screening of, of hackers the night before. And before that, I'll do I'll run a hardware happy hour. And we've got a bunch of people in the local area to give us tours of their spaces as well. So Protopasta are going to do something with their 3D printer. So we can have like uh, factory visits to various different places, like before and afterwards as well. And I, oh yeah, Hackaday normally runs a brunch afterwards as well. So there's also all sorts of like pre and post conference stuff happening as well as the conference itself. Um, it's very sociable, I should say. You know, we do stuff together in the evenings. We have like after parties and all that kind of stuff. So it's um, a pretty informal, um, sociable, convival hardware conference. It's funny. I was going to ask you, is it engineering or maker? And it sounds like the answer truly is both. Definitely. Be- definitely. It sits in It sits in that valley there. It's not just maker I made this no, once. No, it's very no. much. I'm making a thousand of these. Exactly. More like independent makers, um, and and project. You know that, and there are like makery maker project type stuff that you know we have. We have people coming along from that community. You know. Um, Sophie Wong comes to talk about her spaceship before. Um, you know, we put on a really interesting art exhibit this last year in 2023 um, with, you know, we put all of these beautiful like hacker projects on plinths with like nice writing and plaques on the walls next to them just to put these kind of things in a different context, which was super appreciated by the people who are making uh you know, making this art because there's sometimes like there's not really a place to display that kind of work, you know? So while the talks are, I'd say not entirely, but predominantly um, focused on, you know, engineering, hardware projects, there are a lot of kind of lighter tech um, workshops as well. That's for sure. But it's very much focused on like hardware, electronics and open source as well. Uh, Speaking of an art exhibit, uh, Mm -hmm. I heard about the SETI Institute up there in Portland. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's run by Nandini, um, who's a really awesome um, community organizer here. Um, And they run one of the um, hackerspaces. It's not really a hackerspace. It's a a makerspace, I should say, that's inside of PSU, Portland State University. Um, And they do all sorts of really interesting things. I'd say they're more on the... I mean, maker engineer side of things, um, and they're based inside of a university, so there is like, a, you know, like, like a focus on education that they have there. So yeah, we've we've been partners with them a number of times, and hope hopefully um, in twenty twenty four as well. We also work a lot with the physics department, um, and we get you know electron microscopes and for people to have a look through, which is super fun. 
Um, yeah. Neat. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty neat. There's all sorts of, there's all sorts of cool stuff to look at. <laughs> I only brought them up because I saw Deborah Ansel, uh, Geek oh, Bomb yes. Projects is doing an yeah, yeah. actual show with her LED clothes and bags amazing. and hats. And I was like, amazing. Okay. I only saw this in one space and you should be putting this everywhere. It's amazing. Yeah. Anyway. De- Deborah was actually in my hacker art exhibit in 2023. Um, and showed a bunch of her really awesome work. Um, she's she's really talented, yes. um, and she knows her she knows her stuff as well. Check out Deborah. <laughs> um, but they also had it at a Gap. I was surprised, yes, and yes. it didn't occur to me that that was possible <laughs> until I started talking to you. Yes, yes. So the venue that I've chosen, where I've got to put in my own internet, bring in every single chair, everything. Uh, it is actually a semi-abandoned mall in the centre <laughs> of Portland called the Lloyd Centre. Like, there's actually a famous thing that happened in this. Did you ever watch I, Tonya? Or you know who Tonya Harding is? Yes. Um, okay, so um, the ice skater that like broke her rival's leg or arm right. or whatever it is. Anyway, so she practiced nice. on the in the ice skating. She you know she grew up practicing on the ice skating rink in the Lloyd uh. Centre which is still there today. It's not at its full size anymore, but it's still there today. So it's, it's like, it's one of these malls that has like, everybody left, right? There's a couple of like stragglers. There's one Hot Topic. There's a Cinnabon. <laughs> but the rest of it is like empty or it's full, because it's so dead, they've filled it up with some really cool stuff. It's like gone the other side. Like there's a really cool Lego store. There's a bunch of vintage stores. There's a great comic store. Like all of these different creative little uh, businesses amongst largely empty mall with an occasional, you know, hot topic. It's quite an interesting venue. Um, and yeah, we've got the, we've, we've rented out, we've basically become tenants for a month, right? We've rented out what used to be the Gap or more accurately, it was like gap for women and gap for men and gap baby. So there's like actually three separate areas <laughs> in in the plus we get like the back staff room as well, which is really fun. Um so yeah, we're we're turning like gap baby into stage one. <laughs> and we're <laughs> we're like we've all of the changing rooms we're going to have different installations in them um like i'm messaging all of my hacker friends right now like hey do you want to come do an installation in a gap changing room please like <laughs> the the cfp will be by the time this um this podcast goes out the cfp will be live uh, sorry the call for proposals look at me using acronyms like a naughty person um, yeah, so, so the call for proposal will be live um, and we will be um, asking for people who, if they want to do installations, if they want to put something in the hacker art exhibit, if they want to take over a gap fitting room to do something weird. Uh, we're also this year for the first time doing a hacker space program. Um, so one of my favorite things about the Euro hacker events, I used to go to Congress and camp and all that. I still do, actually. But um they have they have like this thing where lots and lots of different hacker spaces from all over Europe um they will come and represent and it was you know they come and represent their space in this wider space and it's so fun to go from place to place and see people's projects and you know really get to know different um different hacker spaces from different locations so we're doing that so basically if you want to if you're part of a hacker space and you want to come and um, well there's some free tickets that we'll um we'll put out there as well so um yeah all of that will um will be out um, by the time this episode airs <laughs> what would you put in a gap changing room what what immersive experience um so uh, my friend sherry wants to run a tiny karaoke booth um which is a ha- which is a euro hacker tradition actually we always have yeah, karaoke at euro fun. hacker events um we have i mean the thing is with portland right there's a bunch of hardware people um but there's also a bunch of like weirdo artists um so there's loads of people who are looking at doing installations there's a guy called matthew rempes he does really interesting like cctv um installations where it takes the visual input from cctv cameras and turns it into like sound um and visual art um, yeah, there's, there's just all sorts of things we're going to do. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it too much, but there's definitely going to be a number of really interesting experiences in the changing room. <laughs> that sounds like a show title. <laughs> Maybe not this show, but okay. 
I, you know, I'm like, I'm sitting here like, okay, what I want to do is I want to soundproof it so that it's well soundproofed. Oh yeah. And then put Northern Lights and a and a heated Adirondack mm-hmm. chair so that you're you're mm-hmm. kind of laying. <laughs> you can't lay down in in the changing rooms, but something comfortable and solo, and a heated Adirondack chair, and then. Um, and then air conditioned the crap out of the air. And so you're, you're, you're in winter, but <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, sorry. I, I, I'm, yes. But with, <laughs> with, but with screaming babies coming through the speakers, I mean, where's the changing room coming? Oh, no, I, I just want, and, and I think maybe the, the Northern Lights would sing the way I always think they should. How do you think the Northern Lights would sing, Alicia? Well, high, kind of high pitched with occasional, kind of like whale songs. Okay. Oh, I see. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think that, I don't think they'd be high pitched though. I think they'd be really resonant. Depends on the color. <laughs> All right. The fast colors would 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 be higher pitched. All right, I can see that. I can see that. Okay. Well, my call for what? No, I I can't. I'm sorry. I, I won't be there. <laughs> Um, okay, what else are you looking for for proposals? Am I? Oh, proposals. Yeah, I mean, people who want to speak about things that are even vaguely related to um, hardware, open source, discussions about cool materials, um, talking about your projects, talking about things that you find difficult, lots of show and tells about um, spe- how to do specific things. But one of my favorite talks um, of recent years um, was about was just a big technical dump around um, uh, current e paper, and also mm. I did. Uh, there was a really interesting one that was all just about USB C, just like an hour on USB C, um, and it was super fascinating. You can get really deep. It's not like surface level talks. I mean, you can do like people come and talk about you know all sorts of things, but you can get quite deep. Um, talks as well so that's cool um so yeah basically talks workshops art exhibit stuff um projects on tables people coming from hacker spaces anything really and it's going to be a really fun event we do lots of stuff together so if, if you want to get involved just uh just say hi okay so my origami flex paper that yeah. changes automatically because I put electrons in, and so it's a software controlled. I have no idea where I'm going with this because I'm not making it, but it sure sounds cool, doesn't it? But, I mean, I would just take some origami and put it on the wall. Why not? <laughs> Don't tempt me. My walls are kind of full right What's now. What's your address? <laughs> I'm uh, not going to give it out live on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I do know a thing or two about security. <laughs> Giving out your address like on on the air is probably not the best idea. <laughs> we don't even really like it. People give their email address on the show. No, me either. Okay, so well, conference. I'm not done oh, yet. Sorry, go ahead. I have questions about them all. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Post-apocalyptic yeah. with Cinnabon. Well, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the mall, a mall, an empty, partially empty mall sounds like actually a perfect place because you've got all those rooms exactly. that things can be divided up. You've got the long concourse where stuff can be exactly. put in. Exactly, uh, yeah. How, how, did, how, did, how did you end up with that venue being a possibility? Was it like people, were they reaching out and saying, hey, somebody should throw a conference here? Or? No, no. Well, like, like anything, we, I mean, finding the right venue is the most difficult and important part i think really because it sets the whole vibe for an event right so I, I just hit the pavement and i've looked at so many different places so many different places um and i just had gone to the lloyd center to go to the comic store actually um with my friend um and she happened to mention that she saw that there was a conference um there before and i thought huh hmm. I actually think a a hacker conference inside of a semi-abandoned mall would be a really cool idea. Um, So, yeah, here we are. I've booked it. (laughs) You actually had a name for these types of spaces. Oh, uh, yeah, like a liminal space. Well, it's because, I mean, oh, oh, you mean a meanwhile space. That's the word I used, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically what I mean by that, so having done a lot of events in on the grassroots side of things, AKA without a budget. Um, I used to use a lot of these like quote unquote, meanwhile spaces. And what that means is if, if, you know, for example, in in the Lloyd center, right. It's a dead mall within the next three or four years, it's going to be, you know, 
bulldozed and developed, right? But until then, they're still trying to make a, vi- a small amount of money before, you know, they're not going to put new big clients in there, but they do have a lot of space that's available. So if you can find those spaces that are somewhere that they're a couple of years off of being condemned or turned into something different, you can often find really interesting, cheap spaces to host events if you yeah but you just gotta hit the pavement and look around <laughs> but this is a lot different than going to your local marriott or even your local university oh, yeah. and saying yeah. i have 300 people five rooms in a ballroom and i want cheap catering yeah. how much will it be just give me yeah. give me the end total and I'll, I'll worry about the programming yeah yeah exactly um no i mean and i did look at a few i did look at a few places that were that right this turnkey solution you turn up they put the chairs out for you they handle all the av blah 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 but what i kept coming back to was there's no get in time and you don't get any extra space um whereas we could rent this unit for three weeks and have two weeks to build up something interesting and creative right so i just thought let's experiment let's do something really cool let's see if we can get the community to come in and like help us create something much more interesting than let's go listen to some talks at our local marriott which is great too but this is much more immersive and evolving you know i want to involve a lot more people um, and do a lot more fun things and it it goes with the flavor of the conference well, quite. Exactly. I mean, if I held it somewhere else, it would have a different flavor. But because I've chosen the Lloyd Center, it's it's got this um, slightly edgy, slightly hackery um, 90s vibe to it, you know. Um, yeah, I like it. <laughs> You're upping the chaos level. I am upping the chaos level. But, you know, <laughs> I, I aim to do that more generally. <laughs> Good thing I'm not involved because I would be spending all my time pushing for oh. a 80s, oh, 80s vintage retro arcade. Oh, we're having one. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. We're, we've got all sorts of fun things planned. If we're going, you have oh. to let me know so that I can plan these, co- these proposals. It's not till June. <laughs> yeah, it's not till June. It's not till June. Yeah. I mean, a bit of chaos it's a bit of fun, in my opinion. I think, you know, leaving it, leaving it, you got to leave a little corner for chaos. Oh, chaotic good is my spirit level, yes. That is my alignment. Always has been, always will be. <laughs> it's my D&D alignment, chaotic good. Or at least chaotic neutral. <laughs> yes, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. You can't be consistent if you're chaos. Exactly. I love chaos as long as I'm causing it. <laughs> uh, okay, so... What are the factors that go into choosing how to put on this conference? We talked a little bit about the logistics, which you've decided to Mm -hmm. brew your own. Mm -hmm. I have. I'm a very DIY person, though. I've always been involved in the kind of like DIY hacker culture. So to me, that's just the world that I'm much more comfortable in, you know. And plus you get a bit more control as well. Um, But I guess you've got to decide uh, who, who you're talking to. You've got to think about your audience, think about what they enjoy, think about what they might enjoy, um, think about their comfort levels and a range of different things. I think it's really important to think about the evening stuff as well because um, I don't love conferences that just degenerate into drinking yeah. at the end of – do you know what I mean? Like, So if, if the only option is we can go to the bar, like I just think – I mean, fine, go to the bar, that's cr- totally great, but I like – it's much f- – more fun and more wholesome to do other stuff right so on a on the friday night afterwards with there's a reception at autodesk and they're putting they got this fancy office in, in portland they always do something for us and then the the saturday night we do um a party at the hacker space called control h and um, which is always super fun um but it's it's more you know we also typically will do a scavenger hunt as well around portland um, so we'll have to see if that's uh, that would be really fun when it's scavenger hunt around. We do cycling cycle rides as well last year, so it's just nice to have like an array of like pre game, post game, and then like after party stuff. So it doesn't it's not just the conference and it's not just drinking. You know, I think it's healthier. <laughs> How much does it cost to attend? Um, well, that depends on when you buy your ticket. Sure. Um, so we have like we have a few different levels we do there's like 
an early bird, which will be live the day this podcast goes live. We do have like a pre-sale, which is the, the cheapest level. And that um, that is only for newsletter subscribers. So that goes out every year. Um, and then it goes, I can't remember what we've chosen this year, but it was something like, it's like 150, I think. Um, we also do have um, a. We do also have like a low income ticket program as well, which is which you can get a ticket for forty dollars um, if you're struggling. Um, and we have lots and lots of vol- uh, volunteer positions as well. So depending on when you get it, it's between um, seventy five and two hundred and fifty dollars. Basically, is the is the price range. And I, I do reserve the right to um, be wrong here because we haven't, yeah. <laughs> we haven't, we haven't fully crunched all of the numbers. Um, so uh, yeah, so we have um, a, a range of them depending on depending on what. But lots and lots of opportunities for free stuff too. You mentioned volunteer opportunities, so people who can't mm-hmm, afford it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and there are lots of other activities. So if you are in the area and and maybe want to pop in for a brunch, you. You can just say hello, hello to everyone without. Oh, you totally can, you totally can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of the pre and post game stuff is is just general entry, right? You don't have to have a ticket to go to the screening of hackers at OMSI. I mean, you have to get a ticket to the screening, but you don't have to have a ticket to tear down. Um, like the hardware happy hour, anybody can come. That's the whole point of hardware happy hours and the pre and post game stuff. Yeah. It, we want everybody to be able to come, you know, like the control H members will come to the Saturday night party, even if, um, even if they're not like part of the conference itself. So yeah, there's lots of opportunities to get involved. And this actually is not your job. I mean, it is part of your job. This is no, no, this is, this is very little of my job. Um, I mean, it takes up, you know, it's going to be taking up a certain amount of, uh, of my time this year, but no, this is, this is like a side quest for me. Definitely. I mean, I, I do quite a few events and it's something that's enjoyable to me, but it's certainly not something that I spend my day doing. I've never worked professionally in events or marketing or anything like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a side quest for me, but a big side quest, you know, uh, and an exciting, fun side quest. It, primarily, my job involves um, finding and vetting new submissions for Crowd Supply, um, which is the company I work for. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit about that? Or yeah, um, so my idea of Crowd Supply is something like in the Kickstarter, Etsy, Tindy family. Yeah, I is mean, that the right sort of area to put it, or in, a, in the same kind of area? Yeah, in that we do. So we're we're a platform for crowdfunding and selling open or somewhat open um, hardware devices. And the primary function of my job at Crowd Supply is to assess new projects. So we've got a lot of criteria. We're not just self service. Um, you actually have to apply to be a Crowd Supply campaign. You know, and it's not for everybody, you know, like we have, we require a certain level of openness. Um, we require um, a fully functional final prototype before moving to campaign, which is a deal breaker for a lot of people. Like we're not going to campaign on a render, right? Like the product actually has to exist before we accept it, right? Um, and we've got a bunch of other questions as well. Um, so me and my boss, uh, Josh Lifton, who's the co-founder of Crowd Supply, we meet every day and we just go over all of these submissions, right? And we we you know we can't be domain experts in every single in every single like type of technology, but we're trying to do due diligence, like research what they're doing, try and find what you know equivalents in the market. Um, you know, we just do our homework, right? Um, and that's what I spend a lot of my time doing is is um is asking questions, um, doing a lot of research about other people's projects, um, contracts, emails, yada yada. <laughs> it's all good. Um and, and that's and that's the intake, but I also do quite a bit of outreach as well. And um, by which I mean I just message people and um or like talk to people at conferences if I think they're doing something cool and say, Hi, we exist, FYI. Um but yeah, like super light touch. I don't do a lot of that. Yeah, mostly it's mostly it's assess, um, assessing and questioning new projects. So I'm just finishing up uh, the last class, class per cohort, and uh, that means the the students turned in their projects. 
Mm. And I got to write critiques for them. Oh, I hate doing that. Well, my goal with the students (laughs) is that they make a portfolio project for interviews. Mm -hmm. And I want them to make something they like and something they would be happy to work on in the future. Oh, that's nice, though. So my criteria isn't is pretty loose. And the best part about it is learning all about the new sensors and applications and ideas people have. I just love that part. Oh, for sure. For sure. Do you end up with, you know, 45 open tabs at the end of the day? Um, At least. (laughs) At least. (laughs) I mean, one of the reasons why I think I'm well suited for this job is, you know, I had 10 years as a freelancer and I've worked with basically every microcontroller, you know, common microcontroller out there, most of the common sensors that exist, right? Like, I've even made projects using the Intel Galileo, right? <laughs> so that's a bit for my sins, right? So like, there's, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I have a very deep knowledge in any particular um, genre of hardware, but I have a very broad knowledge of what exists, what's out there, what people are doing with it, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I try and keep up on that. I, it's probably the the thing I enjoy the most about the job is seeing what other people are making, seeing what people are up to, seeing the trends, seeing what new silicon people are excited about, or what new like open library has resulted in something unexpected. You know, I, I really enjoy that aspect of it, kind of getting that bird's eye view of what independent hardware makers are doing at any one time. You know, so like, for example, during the uh, the chip crisis, you know, there was a noticeable, like you could just see if it was, if it wasn't ESP32 or RP2040, like you were just <laughs> out of luck, right? So I would see like all these FPGA projects coming in and then being like sobbing because they couldn't get like anything for like two years, basically. So the only things that we were getting in were based on the available silicon, which was really interesting to see how people got creative with what they had available, you know? It was pretty cool. Did you write critiques? Do you tell people yes, yes yeah, as long yeah. as you or no thank you, yeah, this yeah, is why? Yeah. It's a whole conversation. Cool. And you know, oh no, absolutely. We go into depth really and and I try and give good feedback, particularly if it's for somebody who's starting out um you know, and, and sometimes it's a perfectly good device. It just doesn't really work for crowd supply, you know, mm-hmm. or if there's if there's nothing that's open. Like, we're not, we're like, oh, it, it's not like that it has to be open source hardware, like certified gold standard. You don't have to have designed it in KiCad and release your editable board files, right? But we need you to, like, release firmware and at least a schematic so people can actually see what's going on behind uh, behind the behind your black box of technology or you know like as, as an indie creator like sometimes you fall off the map right it's not like you, you're going to be doing that product forever so it's really nice that people will actually be able to see and possibly service these devices even if the creator drops off the map because they know what's in it and how it works that's a good good thing to remember that indie hardware folks don't always realize is that uh-huh. they're going to want to go on and be done with mm-hmm. this at some point. Uh-huh. <laughs> Are there other common pitfalls that the indie hardware folks? Oh gosh, yeah, lots. Um I mean, I mean, there's some things that are, I would say people don't know a lot about logistics. We get a lot of um, creators who are engineers, but don't know a lot about anything else. Um, so stuff like if you're importing a, you know, an assembled board from China these days, you're going to have a 25% tariff when you're importing a lot of goods, right? And if you're just someone who's worked um, with JLC PCB, you've got a PCBA here, PCBA there, you probably won't know that. Um, and it can really destroy your profit margin if you don't account for that or, you know, not manufacture in China, you know, but there are, obviously it's cheaper. So definitely learning, so knowing about that tariff, that trips a lot of people up. Um, people underprice their products a lot. Yeah. And I, I mean, and that's, I blame, I blame Raspberry Pi for that, right? They've got unrealistically um, inexpensive hardware and people think that they have to compete. Well, that's not true. I mean, particularly for crowd supply, actually, our, our customers are not very price sensitive. They would rather have like the luxury version with like all of the bells and whistles rather than this is a cheap board, right? 
Um, so underpricing is a big deal. And I see people who like have really um, destroy themselves down the road by underpricing, right? Because if your product takes off, um, you want it to be sold by distributors, right? Well, if you don't have an extra 40% margin assigned to that, then your distributor is not, you're not going to get a distribution deal, right? Because the distributor wants their cut. And if you don't price that in from the beginning, um, you're going to be in trouble. So definitely enterprising is a big one. Um, thinking that engineering is the, the, the only task, right? I get a lot of this. <laughs> like, well, yes, they're like, I have made the hardware. Now I'm just going to put it on a website and I'll get lots of customers, Right. Yes, of course. Right? Why wouldn't I? It is brilliant. Right? If I build it, they will come. <laughs> it, that is, oh, I, I bump into that time and time and time again. It is not true. It's and the people not. who do really well are not, are not just the people who are good at hardware. It's the people who are good at hardware and good at communication, right? And then that could be like writing or that could be like video, whatever. You just have to have a, a way that you can actually speak to people, particularly in indie hardware, people want to buy from people, right? So if if it's just yet an, what what we call yam curb, right? Yet another microcontroller board. Um, like if it's just yet another microcontroller dev board, you know, and you've got no community or anything, you're just not going to find, you're just not going to find an audience. So yeah, thinking that your engineering is the most important thing in terms of making a product, you know, but there's so much after that, so much after that. Um, what else? Oh yeah, people who don't get feedback early on. Again, similar to build it and they will come. They like secretly work away and secretly work away for ages on this device, like making up uh, a solution, you know. And but they've not actually tested it with anybody who might want to buy it. They've not, you know, gotten proper feedback at different rounds, and then they just launch it and expect, you know, what was in their brain to be perfect for everybody else, right? Um, so yeah, getting, getting early feedback, um, is, is really important, but people not off, people often neglect to even talk to anybody about it. So well, yeah, no, that's, they that's, might tell me it's a bad idea. <laughs> that's actually well, good. That's good though. Right. Like you want people to pick at it. I mean, you can't please everybody. You can't like, you know, you can't go away and try and incorporate every single feedback you get right you know and some and sometimes you have to take people's feedback with a pinch of salt but you've got to get it out there and see what people are saying it's valuable even if they don't like it especially if they don't like it actually but there is some difficulty there sure <laughs> i mean okay so i'm working on the last images in my book and it's going badly and that's fine it's it'll work out but Showing them to people and saying there's something wrong with this and having people say it's just bad, there is no good was really hard and I didn't mm. like it and I knew it wasn't true because I'd had other people say this makes sense and yes, I see where you're going with this, but that whole how do you how do you know who to trust? How do you decide how you only I mean, I only hear the negative feedback. Of course. And listen, like I've been roasted on the internet and it's not a pleasant feeling. And people are mean when they don't know you uh, as well. Right. So I yeah. would just say like cast a really broad net and don't take any one data point as particular, you know, take it, take it as an average, right? Don't take the meanest or the most um, praise, um, praise filled feedback so cast a broad net but also do it in real life as well people are much less likely to be horrible in real life that is true yeah. <laughs> although most of my real life is christopher and he I'm usually horrible. likes me so oh. it's it's easier I mean, it's also about how you talk about it as well you know particularly with regards to hardware you know People are allergic to, here's my startup, here's my product, come and buy it, here's an advert, you know, but if you're asking, if you're asking people for genuine, um, genuine feedback and actually listening to it, I think, and, and being, 
engaging in places that it's relevant to engage, you know, not just spraying spam everywhere. Um, I think you can still get some really quality feedback from the internet if you ask nicely. <laughs> yeah, and if you ask the right people and you, yeah, yeah. you don't just ask everybody everything no. and keep saying, I sent yeah. you an email, how come you haven't responded yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does yeah. not do you any good. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. But yeah, it, it's it's been hard for me to figure out how to get the right amount, right amount and right quality of feedback sometimes. Yeah, it's true. Um, the idea that you give some critique for projects is is amazing to me because I, I, mm. I do know how long that takes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if um, if it's really not relevant for the audience, then it's much quicker. But yeah. if it is, you know, if it, if you know, if it is relevant to the audience, but it's just not quite right, um, like I, I'll often see like a lot of people trying to compete on cost, like doing a lower cost, you know, Arduino Uno clone or whatever. And I'm like, two dollars is not going to make any difference, you know. Um, so, but but in that instance, it's like they've they've clearly got the skills to design, you know, a good piece of hardware, right? It's just that they're not, you know, they're just they're just putting those skills to use in like a really over like a really saturated area, for example, or they're using like really old stuff, or you know, so we can point people in the direction if it's like design, or we can, you know, and a lot of the time it's that they don't, you know, people don't have prototypes and they don't have anything, right? So we just, you know tell them to go away and come back once they do actually have a real device. Um, so, th- you know, we actually do get people back in. I, you know, I always say I'm very happy to be proven wrong on any count. You know, this we, as I said earlier, like we can't be domain exp- experts in every single genre of technology. It's just that, you know, we... Um, we invest quite a lot into the people we work with, um, both in terms of time, but also money. Um, so I guess I should have mentioned this earlier. So basically, yes, we have a, we have, we do crowdfunding campaigns. Yeah. But that's, that's kind of the start of their relationship with us. Um, so, um, crowd supply. So if you, if you earn, like we match fund basically. So if Hmm. you earn like 50 grand on your crowdfunding campaign, we will place an order paid in advance for an additional up to $50,000 worth of product. So we basically instantly become your biggest customer. And you and we will pay that in advance along with the crowdfunding money. So basically you get double um in advance. You have to deliver product. Like we don't take equity or anything like that. We're literally just placing an, a large advanced order. And then we sell that. But also our parent company, which is Mauser Electronics, they sell that. So any successful creator, well, I shouldn't say any, like most successful creators go on to be distributed with um a non-exclusive deal with uh, Mauser Electronics and that's international as well. So, it's, you know, and that's not a small amount of work to set somebody up as a Mauser supplier and to set up all of these like orders and to get them onto our system. So that's one of the reasons we're quite choosy as we invest a lot into our projects. Yeah. I mean, it makes a lot of sense that yeah, that's yeah. why you have to spend the time up front. Well, yeah, I yeah, didn't exactly. realize that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It's a really good deal, actually. Um, and it's... It helps indie creators really get those lower production costs, right? Um, yeah, and I think that's one of the most powerful things that we offer, um, along with the you know whole Mauser situation. And they do all the you know that's another thing that we, they do is um, they do all the delivery, right? So they do all oh, of the yes. logistics for all of our campaigns. So basically, our creators just send our warehouse one big box of product, and the Mauser warehouse team will pick and pack it um, to all of their um, crowdfunding customers and all of their future customers as well. So they don't have to, you don't have to touch an address label with us. <laughs> as somebody who is allergic to address labels, I oh, totally seriously. like that. I know. Like I, I've done a bunch of my own little products before, and the worst time I ever had was like when I was like, you know what, I'm going to make my own thing and I'm going to ship it out myself. And then I got a few orders in, and I was like, oh, this is terrible. Yes. Like, <laughs> what this did is I do? Terrible. No, why? Why did I try and distribute it myself? <laughs> Never again. <laughs> I, yeah. Some people like that. You know, some people really like taking control of that side of things, but like me, no, I hate it. 
Like, I'd, yeah, so. <laughs> I have a couple listener questions. One is from Chris Greenlee, and we already answered this, but are there dates for Teardown 2024? Yes, the 21st through the 23rd of June um, 2024, and uh, there'll be pre- and post-game stuff as well, so you can stick around or come early. That'll be in Portland, Oregon? Indeed it will. And is there a remote aspect to this? So there typically is. Um, The answer is that depends on what internet I can get installed. (laughs) So maybe... We'll see on the, we'll see, basically. We'll see what, we'll see on the internet. We would typically do it. We will release the videos for free on YouTube afterwards if we can't stream it. If the internet's not good enough for streaming, then um, we will release them. uh, We will release them afterwards. Yeah, we did, we did it last year, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a minor undertaking to do a decent job of streaming. Um, None of this is a minor undertaking. (laughs) So yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. So the, the streaming is one thing that I'm. That's like a nice to have rather than a an essential, and that's very much dependent on the internet situation. So yeah. Sila asked, "What are what is your favorite band?" Oh my goodness! What? Um, well, what's my favorite band? Yeah, that one that's seems kind of hard. It is really difficult. Um, I could tell you things I've been listening to a lot recently. Um, so. I've been listening to Janelle Monet. Has been, I and mean, it's kind of she's she's popular than you might expect. But um, Janelle Monet, a lot of people might know her for acting. Actually, I don't know, but she's also does some really really awesome like Afrofuturism sci-fi stuff. And she did this whole like two concept albums, um, like that was all around like this this android that fell in love with a human and was being chased and she had to escape. And then it turns out like she's, you know, some kind of special being. But it kind of, it, 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 you know, it, it came out in, I really enjoyed the fact that she used, you know, video plus music, plus she actually released a bunch of pros as well around that. So I thought that was super cool, that like multimedia aspect to it. So I've really been digging a lot of a lot of her work recently. Um but in terms of our favorite band, that's too difficult. Let's just say Led Zeppelin. How about that? Let's just say that. That's, nobody's got you no one's gonna get fired for saying Led Zeppelin, right? <laughs> And um, let's just go with that. Yeah, I grew up with a lot of Led Zeppelin. With my with my dad was a big fan of Led Zeppelin, so um, let's just choose that. Let's just choose that. Oh, I have got a music thing to share actually, and I am only sharing this because I told my boss this yesterday, and he had no idea. So you know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio play. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know the entrance tune. Yeah, um, so you know the, on the banjo. Da, 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 yes, da, yes, I remember. Da, yeah. yeah, you know it. You know it. That's actually it's not just it's not an intro tune. It's actually a full length track by the Eagles, and it rocks. So if you didn't know oh, that wasn't Eagles? an intro, <laughs> yes, the <laughs> Eagles. Like the Eagles. <laughs> I know. Literally, go and like, give it a listen. Um, I'm terrified I've said the wrong band name now. No, I'm certain it's the Eagles. But yeah, go. And, it's called the Journey of the Sorcerer. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you're if you're a hitchhikers fan um you'll definitely enjoy it <laughs> uh sila would also like to know if you have a favorite fruit <laughs> to make an instrument of oh okay okay now that changes my answer Fra- <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be blueberries but you just can't play those <laughs> oh yeah yeah you can play a blueberry you can definitely play a blueberry you can you can play anything pretty much as long as you um you know uh, as long as you're using the right microcontroller, <laughs> <laughs> it's m- most fruit. I mean, it's just water, right? You know, you just is so. I mean, the classic is the banana, of course. You know, everybody's played a banana. Well, not everybody, but you know, a lot of people have. <laughs> a lot of people have played a banana. I use it for um, all my phone calls, but I don't know about playing. Right, right. Actually, my funnest, <laughs> the funnest thing that I made with fruit to play was actually not the fruit itself so i made a bunch of raspberry jelly that i used as uh, and i made them in these molds right and then i used them as bongos and it was (laughs) oh oh my gosh it was so funny like the slap (laughs) and the wiggle wiggle. oh my word the slap the jiggle the Oh my god! It was just nope, so. No, we're not using so that like for a title. The, yeah, 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 I see yeah. you typing that for a title. We're not using that for <laughs> the a title. Slap and the jiggle. 
Nope. Not using <laughs> the slap, that. the jiggle, and then the synth noise. I mean, who could ask for more? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's my that's my, that's my fruit question. My favorite fruit um, in general is probably a good old apple. What can you play on an apple? Anything. Anything. They run Logic and Ableton. And... <laughs> uh, okay, so last one <laughs> from Sila. <laughs> How did you get good at writing? Oh, <laughs> how did I get? The same way you get good at anything Practice? by doing it. Yeah. No, everybody hates that answer. I know. <laughs> it's the worst So frustrating. <laughs> I know. You just got to do it. That's all I'm saying. You got to do it and you got to read a lot and write. You know, you are what you do. So as long as you, you know, when you're writing, you are a writer. Um, and yeah, and and in terms of, I mean, you know, if, if you're looking to, if you're looking at that question as like, how do you do it professionally? Um, then just, you know, you'd need, you need like three things on your portfolio. You know, you like, I always say you've got to have three things. I've worked at X, X and X. So if you've got three things, you can, uh, you can make an interesting sentence out of it. So get, get three things on your CV or resume, whatever you call it here. Um, and then you can start shopping yourself around. Um, but you know, I mean, writing is good, but you have to have something to write about as well right so there's there's the content side of it and then there's the stylistic side of it i mean i i wouldn't say i you know i'm not an amazing prose writer or anything i would i'd consider my writing i mean i guess I, I did do like some journalism stuff as well but primarily speaking i would consider myself like a writer of recipes but it's just it's not the re- you know the recipes are for electronics um rather than you know food so you know a writer of recipes. I consider myself a writer of stories, yeah. even as I'm working on a technical book. And you say writer of recipes, and I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, there are different kinds of writers. Oh, totally, totally. I've done a, I've done a bunch of different kinds of writing as well. But um, the the easy, <laughs> recipes are easy to sell in, right? They were, you know, you you um, you can always everybody always needs a, a make. Right? Everybody always needs here's a cool project that uses this cool thing. If you can write it up nicely and make sure it's current, then um, you know it's easy to you know, relatively easy to um, get paid for an article, right? So. Um, yeah, there's there's the skill, but then there's also having a sense for content and what fits in. If you write it, they will come, right? Sell. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. you... Uh, well, people people have to know about you and people have to remember that you exist as well. I mean, that's basically what my Twitter was for back in the day when I was a big Twitter person. You know, partially it was sharing the projects that I do and partially it's just reminding people that I exist so that when a project comes up, they're like, oh, I remember this person. Maybe we should get her in to write this thing, right? Um, so, Yeah. <laughs> and so now you work for Crowd Supply, where before mm. you used to do conferences more grassroots and be part of them and mm. organize but not be in charge. And before you used to have communities and support communities and talk to people about their projects and be interested and write about them. And you did all that for fun. And now they're paying you to do it? It's true. I've done kind of like a 180 on what I do for fun and what I do to get paid. Like for a bunch of years, are you doing accounting for fun? You can tell me. I'm not doing accounting (laughs) for fun. Like my word, my word. Like no, like I'm tax day. I'm usually crying. Don't worry. Like (laughs) um, no. Um, so so while I was working as a maker slash writer slash you know whatever it was that I could do to make money um I did a lot of community work just on my own just because I loved it just because I've gotten so much from the hacker and maker community myself so when I say like I'm a self-taught maker actually that's nonsense I've been taught by the community I've been taught by people in hacker spaces I've been taught by my friend in a kitchen you know I've been taught by youtubers um and I just really want to be able to give back to that kind of community. Um, So I really enjoyed doing, I did that for fun, right? I did that for fun, but also as a sense of obligation and also as a sense of activism, you know. Um, 
but I got to a point where I was making things, I was really dissatisfied, right, with the way I, you know, like, because when you're making something and you've always got to make it help you pay your rent, you know, you've always got to make sure it sits in six pages or, you know, you're explaining the same things over and over and over again. Like, I've explained what PWM is like a million times. And honestly, I got to a point where if I had to explain PWM and M again, I probably would have just laid down and died. Like, it was... <laughs> I was so over it. I was so over it. I was so over the recipe writing and I was really ready to do bigger, more ambitious projects that wouldn't really work for the content that I was making. So I I, I t- consciously made a decision to go into a more like traditional job job. So I'm not like making my own devices, like I'm helping other people make theirs. I'm like running events and, you know, like, like any job job, a lot of it is contracts and emails. Right. And, but I did that on purpose so that, you know, I can get all this spare time to, uh, to make stuff. Now, obviously when you work full time, it doesn't always work like that, but that was the idea, right. That I would start getting paid for, um, my hardware community work and then have the brain space in the evenings to really advance my technical skills and work on my own projects. So that was the idea. I mean, it's it's been a really difficult transition. Um, I mean, and also I immigrated to a new country in December 2020, which was very complex and confusing. But now now I kind of know my way around um, and I've rebuilt my workshop. It is actually starting to turn out like I had hoped. I mean, like Monday to Friday, I don't have any energy to work on my own projects. But on the weekend or say over Christmas period, like I actually do manage to get stuck in and work on some of the projects that I always, you know, and level up some of my skills in ways that um, was difficult for me to do while I was like constantly like hustling, making these projects, right? So yeah, it's been it's been a weird change, but it's starting to pay off, I think. Cool. Yeah. You mentioned you were working on a sequencer. I'm working on a sequencer. I mean, to be honest with you, it's, I mean, it's less about, it's, it's a project that I'm working on, um, for an educational aim, right? So, I mean, I've messed around in KeyCard a bunch of times in previous versions, but the new version of KeyCard 7 is like a huge step up. Everyone's saying, oh, it's so much better, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, right, fine, fine. This is my project to learn KeyCard 7 because I've been seeing everybody's uh, I've been seeing everybody's like beautiful renders and like, I'm like, Ooh, look at these real nice things that are coming out from KiCad 7. Every, you know, the days of SVG to Shenzhen are thankfully over, you know, it used to be so painful to make something pretty in KiCad, but um, it is much more enjoyable now. So I've been, I've been focusing in on that, on that. And I also like, I've designed a bunch of breakout boards and stuff before, but I've never designed my whole system from scratch, you know, like with USB, microcontroller, power, everything, right? So everything on one board. So it's really an exercise for me to level up my PCB design skills and also become much more comfortable with KiCad as a piece of software. Um, And also to just as a design exercise, right? Um, Mm -hmm. It's been really interesting. Yeah, I've been working with my friend, um, I don't know if you know Timon. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Timon's my friend from um, from you know German hacker circles, you know, um, and we've been talking uh, maybe like once a month, I'd say, um, for the last year or so. And I will just—he's been super generous with his time. I will ask him um, a bunch of questions, like I'll do all my own work, and then I'm like, "Why is this like this? What happens here?" And he—we did this really, really fascinating. Because I've always been a little bit nervous about USB-C, right? Because uh, <laughs> there's so much you can do. But we did this really interesting session where we like just sat there for an hour. And all we did was look side by side at like different open source hardware, like their, their implementations of USB-C, right? So we could look at the commonalities. And, well, you know, while I can read my own schematics, having somebody there who is an experienced designer where I could be like, why have they done that? Mm-hmm. Why is this bit different to this? Like, this is like what I call like design engineering, right? Um, And that stuff is much harder to learn. Like I can learn KiCad on my own, right? I can learn how, you know, I can can look at a reference design on my own, but like it's about the design choices that I felt were 
um, not really visible to me um, as someone who doesn't have formal training in in electronics design. So, um, I mean, obviously, you know, when I say electronics design, I'm not talking like analog or like, you know, like RF is is a, and, and analog designs are witchcraft to me. I'm talking about like moving components around on a PCB, right? <laughs> but still, like all the design decisions that go into that um you know, it's it's been really fascinating to be able to speak to someone on a semi regular basis about about the decisions that I've been making. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's it's been really fun. I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it. And KeyCat Seven actually is way better than the previous one. So, yeah, um, if you take nothing away, I definitely recommend taking a taking a peek at KeyCat Seven if you haven't already. <laughs> it's a good one. Well, they um, they put a bunch of there's they put a bunch of money into it, and I know that CERN put a couple of their engineers on KiCad for a couple of years. I don't know if they're still going, but um, but that really stepped up the whole um, the whole program for that software. Definitely, yeah, it's good, cool. Oh, but you were going to ask us about the Raspberry Pi. I was going to ask you about the Raspberry Pi. Mm. So the um, so yeah, my my question to you, you're like, do you have any questions? Um, and I do have a question for you actually. Um, so um, for my sequencer that I've been working on, I'm using the RP2040 as the microcontroller um, for this device, and I'm primarily using the RP2040 because it's got really great documentation for someone like me. So I can go in and I can really look at the example board designs and they do really lay out a lot of the reasons behind the reference design. So I've been finding I, that the main reason why I've chosen RP2040 is the good documentation as well as the community support. However, I was wondering um, if you take away that community support and the document and the docs and, the, and frankly the availability of the RP twenty forty, and how do you rate the actual functionality of the silicon as somebody who has done a lot of embedded design and used a lot of different chips? So, yeah, that's my question. I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, they, you know, it has a nice selection of peripherals. The core is in Cortex M zero, so you can, mm. you know, compare it to all the other Cortex M zeros out there. Uh, it's got the programmable IOs, which are interesting for certain uses. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to use those. I'm going oh, to try and use the PIO. That's one of the reasons I chose the RP2040, because I want to play with the PIO functionality. Yeah, sorry, Karen. Kind of. uh, I think the only weird thing is the, something you mentioned last episode, Elisa, is that it doesn't have internal flash. Right. So that mm-hmm. makes it more expensive. Yeah. M- expensive, yeah. I think, to integrate into a system. It makes it more complex to put on a board. Right. But you also have to, if you're pri- price comparing right. an MCU with internal flash against the RP2040, it's not apples to apples. No. And that has manufacturing implications as well. Some good, some bad. Um, unfortunately, I hear a lot of people saying they're going to use the PIO, and I don't see a lot of people using <laughs> yeah. the PIO, well, which yeah. worries me a little bit. I don't I like think... that about it. Yeah, yeah. Is it just um, that it turns I... out to not be necessary because it's got all the other peripherals it's just it it ends up being a i mean it's tricky is, it's not it's, something you're just going to do as a c programmer in a minute it's got great documentation yeah and you get used to using their libraries and you yeah, get used yeah. to it being pretty simple mm. and you can prototype everything on Wakwi, which is brilliant yes yeah, giant Wakwi. <laughs> um but then you get to the pio and now it's hard and maybe mm. if it was hard the whole time, you'd be like, okay, I can do this. I'll push through. Mm. Or maybe it would always have been that hard and you would just not not be willing to to fuss with it. Um, yeah. So I'm interested in hearing if you do successfully use the PIO. I, I'm not saying nobody has. People definitely have. And I've I've had at least one student successfully do it. I just end up having a lot of students that say, that's my plan. And I'm like... You know, there's already an I squared C port, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> certainly. Don't use it if you don't have to. You're using it for something weird, not not for something normal. Or something fast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen some examples of code, but I mean, I've not spun up the board yet. So, um, well, actually, one of the other reasons I'm embarking on this um, design journey is uh, I'm really interested in production. Um, back in the midst of time, I used to work in book. Um, 
publishing and I was always really interested in the in the um, production side there, you know, like the paperweights and the different finishes and so on. And after listening to Bunny talk about, sorry, Bunny Huang talk about all the different advanced PCB services you can get these days, I've been, and like, of course, seeing all of the different artistic ways in which people are using um, like silk screens and um, different layers on the PCB in, um, in the wider like hacker and to a certain extent badge culture as well. Um, I'm just, I just really want to learn how to make cool effects on a PCB. You know, um, that's 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 what I really love. I I just like the nitty gritty of how things are made and like how things are actually laid down and you, different production options. I just think that's super interesting to me. I'm on a Discord where there's a a channel called Cute PCB, mm. and it has the neatest PCBs, and they're all colored. And I mean, it's a maker. I think you're on it too, but I don't know if you play there. Um, I don't do anything anymore. Um, but they talk about hermit. how to how to get things to look right, what what to put copper under so you get a translucent effect versus a colored yeah, effect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm so amazed by that. And exactly. Teardown last year had at least one, maybe two talks about making pretty yeah, PCBs. Yeah. We did, yeah, we did. Um I mean, it's so much more accessible than it used to be to get these things done and so much yeah. cheaper as well. You know, you can do some really interesting things. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's very much the kind of thing that we would go into at Teardown. Very much like we love that kind of, we love that production stuff. The actual, it, that's what I'm saying, like the practical side of electronics, you know, it's super interesting. The practical side, me. making your board look like a cute cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I have a question about your job again and being head of community. Yes. Which is kind of a weird title. It doesn't really, I don't know that it that's what you do, but mean. community no. is something I do think about with you. And uh, it's true. You mentioned earlier you aren't on Twitter anymore. You're not doing social media. Where are you finding community these days? So historically, I used to go to the internet to find community, to share my projects and to find other people who were interested in the same weird things as me. But as I've gotten um, older and more involved in the hacker community, and also as I've l relied less on social media to find work, um, I find that I'm actually going to real life events and setting up real life meetups um, to fulfill the same need, right? So being able to share my projects in real life with people, like on a table in front of them, there's no one who's being mean to me. And, you know, I just couldn't stand the sniping um, at me on social media. Like it was just every so often it was just there. And, you you know, you might hear 100 positive things and then like mm -hmm. one bad thing. Mm -hmm. But then I would just always get hung up on the one bad thing. So I would just be like, you know what, this isn't worth it for me anymore. I'm not actually having fun. I feel bad about sharing my projects. So I just stopped engaging really with social media um, and started, like I started Hardware Happy Hour in Portland, which has over 500 members now. I started Sound Hackers so I could find other people who are making instruments. And I've just actually done the work in the city I live in to find people that I really vibe with, you know. And also going to interesting conferences that are really relevant to me and, and the kind of culture that I want to be part of. Yeah, definitely, definitely taken a step away from social media in the last few years, that's for sure. That makes sense. It's hard yeah. to find a good community. It is. Like, I had to build one. Like, both of the events that I go to in Portland are, um, are ones that I created, um, partially because when I moved to Portland, I didn't have any friends, right? I moved there December 2020 when nobody was accepting friendship applications. <laughs> and, like, I spent a lot of time – and, you know, and I've moved from Europe, right? So, basically, by the time I finished work, everybody I knew was asleep, right? So, I was super lonely, and then my friend Jerry, also who's a, also a hardware hacker, moved to Portland as well. And we were like, we've got to find friends. How are we going to find friends? Like, we're dying of loneliness and, like, frustrated geek geekiness. Um, so we, uh, I started this hardware happy hour um, and 
as a, just directly as a as a reason, you know, because I wanted to find friends, nerdy friends in the neighborhood. And you know what? It really, really worked. Um, I've met so many interesting people and seen so many cool projects um, just by doing, just by setting up this event. And it doesn't actually take that much work to do. You just find a bar that is friendly to you and choose a, you know, choose a day, always Tuesday, or you should always choose Tuesdays. Um, but um, it, it, it doesn't take a lot once you've set it up. And it really is such a rewarding thing to do and such a valuable thing to do, actually. Yeah, human connections are very important. Yeah, they are. They are. Um, it's easy. It's easy to downplay the importance of um, you know meetups and community when it comes to um, technology. I think this is this um, this idea of like this lone genius sat at his computer, or always a his at his computer with his hoodie up typing on his own, but. Like that's that's nonsense. You know, we learn from each other and by coming together and sharing what we're working on, we're raising everybody's game. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, Helen, do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, I would like to um, invite anybody who would like to to um, to put in a proposal for Teardown or just come along and hang out with us. That would be dope. Um, or if you're not local, I would definitely encourage you to think about starting up a hardware happy hour if you don't feel like there's um, a lot of people in your location that you can talk nerdy with. Our guest has been Helen Lee, head of community at Crowd Supply. Thanks, Helen. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Thank you to our Patreon listener Slack group for questions and to Memfault for their support. And of course, thank you for listening. You can always contact us at showitembedded.fm or hit the contact link on Embedded FM. And now a quote to leave you with from Charles Schultz. All his life, he tried to be a good person. Many times, however, he failed. For after all, he was only human. He wasn't a dog. (laughs) 